Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Six Months of Set Theory and Higher Order Logic. This is month number three of Logic 301, looking at piano arithmetic. Today we're going to be looking at the principle of mathematical induction, the fifth and final of our piano postulates. Now, the final piano postulate is often referred to as the principle of mathematical induction. It basically states that if some property applies to zero and if, for all natural numbers, a number having that property implies that that number's successor also has that property, then that property applies to all natural numbers. This can be formulated in terms of sets or classes as well. If zero is in some class, and for all natural numbers, being in that class means that your successor is in that class, then all natural numbers are in that class. We can think of this as uh, saying that the natural numbers are just in one single straight line. If something happens to zero, and if something happens to the number before you, then it will happen to you as well, then that thing has to happen to all numbers. There cannot be any loops that are disconnected from the line. One can imagine this postulate like links in a chain or a line of dominoes. In order to ensure that you only have one link of chain, if you have a big pile of chain on the ground, you need to first pull on that first link and to ensure that each link is connected to the next. As long as every link is connected to the one after it and you pull on that first link, when you pull on that first link, every other link should follow. But if there was a separate set of chain, pulling on that first link wouldn't lead to that separate set of chain coming as well. Our current postulates allow for there to be basically two links of chain, two lengths of chain. But in order to have a good number line that only all the numbers come one after another, we need to have just that one single length that starts with zero. To make sure every domino will fall, you need to make sure that the first one falls and that each domino is close enough to the previous domino to fall when it falls. This principle can be useful because it's how we can show that certain things apply to all natural numbers. So think of it like this. We have option one and option two. Based on the postulates we've done so far, we can't prove that the natural numbers are not option two. Without the principle of mathematical induction, the set of all natural numbers could be either option 1 or option 2. We want it to look like option 1, but we don't have anything that can disprove option 2. In option 2, of course, we have both the traditional set of natural numbers that we would think of, but also another set of numbers where A is the successor of P, B is the successor of A, C is the successor of B, etc., and around in a circle. Because none of these, only zero, zero is the only number without a previous successor. There's no branches in any way. This is possible with all of our postulates so far. So we need another principle to show that option two is not possible and option one is the only option. But with the principle of mathematical induction, option two is impossible because if some property applied to zero and having that property implied that your successor has that property, it wouldn't imply that A, B, or C, et cetera, have that property because that kind of process of zero has it and all the successors of zero have it only means that every number in that top number line has it. A is not the successor of zero or any number that is a successor of a successor of zero or a successor of a successor of a successor of zero. And so that separate circle would never get hit by that kind of domino line of mathematical induction. And so option two, if we have the principle of mathematical induction, option two cannot be what we're describing. The only thing we could possibly be modeling and describing is option one, the line of natural numbers, which is exactly what we are trying to describe. It's important to note that mathematical induction is importantly different from scientific induction. Scientific induction means must assume the uniformity of nature. The future will always be like the past. Check out our video on the problem of induction and Hume for more on that without proof in order to function and is therefore not deductively valid. That's why there's an important difference between deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning relies on this assumption of uniformity of nature, which has its problems. Mathematical induction, on the other hand, does not require such lofty assumptions. It merely requires an axiom that defines the number line to be unbroken. 
It doesn't assume the kind of equivalence of the uniformity of nature in math. In other words, something which applies to zero must apply to the successor of each number. But rather, it explicitly states that as a criteria and requires anyone that would use this axiom to prove not only that the principle applies to the first natural number, but also that applying to one natural number means that it must apply to the successor. So it's all to say that scientific induction there are lots of problems for it, the problem of induction, all of these skeptical questions for it. Mathematical induction doesn't have those problems because for mathematical induction to work, you explicitly have to prove the very principle that's in question for scientific induction that you can't really prove or would require itself to be proved. Whereas for mathematical induction, you have to prove that principle. You have to prove that if it applies to one number, it must apply to its successor as well to use the principle of mathematical induction. This can be formulated in several different ways. We're going to formulate it in terms of set theory. If zero is a member of a set, and if being a member of that set implies that your successor is a member of that set, then all natural numbers are a member of that set. However, this can also be formulated as an axiom schema. You may see this in other situations, like the one we saw with the axiom of separation earlier in this series, where different formulas can be instantiated into that axiom schema i.e. if zero satisfies a particular property, schema, etc., and if satisfying that schema implies that your successor satisfies that schema, all natural numbers satisfy that schema. This is one of the reasons that set theory is really nice to kind of manage some of these higher order logic issues because we can just about talk about being members of sets or not being a member of sets as opposed to satisfying a particular property or schema, something like that. But it, it can be formulated in that way and you will see it formulated in that way if you look wide and far. Up next, we're going to be looking at how to build the piano postulates. Now that we have talked about what these five postulates are, we are going to, conceptually, we're going to go through the logically rigorous process of defining their concepts and then proving the postulates themselves. Because you can always just take the postulates as assumptions and build math up from there. What we're trying to do here is not do that, but rather take the axioms and assumptions we already have in set theory and prove, with a couple of definitions, prove that the Piano postulates will hold. Because once we've proven the Piano postulates, we can build up from them. So a lot of systems may take the Piano postulates as axioms or assumptions, but what we're going to do here is actually prove them using the set theory that we have to show that all of our proofs in mathematics can be reduced underneath themselves to set theory and to logic. So stay tuned for that video. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.